And uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Chris Jenks, and he, I think, really helped. He was like kind of the straw that broke the, the complete lack of supply that existed, the camel boom, broke it by, he published an open source technology for uh, extracting the iboga alkaloids using household uh, vinegar and uh, clean ammonia. And so uh, with that, I will uh, hand the microphone to him and uh, he'll carry on about his work. Switch the video. Switch. We gotta switch the and move over this mic. The ibogaine list here on my nice Linux powered laptop. And mm -hmm. uh, for any of you who are interested in communicating more about Ibogaine, if you're not already on this list, what I just want to let you know the they conference? exist. I'm just curious. All, they're all talking about you, Dana. Cold. No, no, that's <laughs> not what I, that's not what I, were they able to find it? Yes. Oh, how to stream, I yeah. see. Yeah, and then I, the, the two that say two are the ones I posted, so I made sure that they had the little, oh, let me get out of here. So when do they get the information about how to stream? Seven o'clock at night? Um, no, it was yesterday morning. Okay, good. Yeah. So let me start this thing. There it goes. Okay. Um, now, I hope I don't bore some people here, well, most people here, because it is a chemistry talk, but I'd like to make it more general uh, interest. I'd like to, everybody here to have something that they can uh, uh, benefit from with the chemistry. I see this. Chemistry is kind of like, um, you know, I've taught chemistry, my degree is in organic chemistry, and, um, but what I'm trying to do here with this chemistry, it's, I see chemistry is kind of like a, a big tree, and here I am reaching up to the tree branch and lowering it down to the ground so that anybody who wants to can come over and pick this, this branch, which is Ibo uh, extraction chemistry. Um, by, by making it so that you can understand it without you having to go through a, you know, a, a, a degree and, and learn the terminology and figure out how simple it is. Mm -hmm. um, the Ibogaine list here on my nice Linux powered laptop. And mm -hmm. uh, for any of you who are interested in communicating more about Ibogaine, if you're not already on this list, what I just want to let you know the they conference? exist. I'm just curious. All, they're all talking about you, Dana. Cold. No, no, that's <laughs> not what I, that's not what I, were they able to find it? Yes. Oh, how to stream, I yeah. see. Yeah, and then I, the, the two that say two are the ones I posted, so I made sure that they had the little, oh, let me get out of here. So when do they get the information about how to stream, seven o'clock at night? Um, no, it was yesterday morning. Okay, good. Yeah, so let me start this thing. There it goes. Okay. Um, now, I hope I don't bore some people here, well, most people here, because it is a chemistry talk, but I'd like to make it more general uh, interest. I'd like to, everybody here to have something that they can uh, uh, benefit from with the chemistry. I see this chemistry is kind of like, um, you know, I've taught chemistry, my degree is in organic chemistry, and, um, but what I'm trying to do here with this chemistry, it's, I see chemistry is kind of like a, a big tree, and here I am reaching up to the tree branch and lowering it down to the ground so that anybody who wants to can come over and pick this, this branch, which is Ibo uh, extraction chemistry, um, by, by making it so that you can understand it without you having to go through a, you know, a, a, a degree and, and learn the terminology and figure out how simple it is. Um, <laughs> Let's see here. Um, as far as my outlook, I, I have a strong um, vision of, of personal responsibility. I, I have the same sort of attitude as Dr. Shulgin, who um, has some of my, uh, you know, same same drive uh, for exploring uh, all the uh, possible uh, solutions that there can be for people. And um, but we both. 
we, you know, the idea is that, you know, a person can, anybody in the world can go out and eat, drink drain cleaner if they want to. And, and if you put suicide laws aside, um, we're pretty much responsible for our, our own lives. Um, and that's sort of the attitude I have when I make technology that could produce ibogaine available. You know, it's, you know, usually you'd put it in the public, the scientific literature and, you know, anybody can still get it from there, sort of, except for it's, uh, you know, these uh, sub subscription-only services anymore. But um, the um, the um, brain fog. I need some <laughs> yeah, right. Help me focus. Um, no, actually, like I said this morning in the in the um, in the memorial, I'm I'm not, you know, I'm I'm pretty much of an introvert, and I'm not a uh, practiced public speaker. So I hope you'll you'll uh, have patience. Um, in any case, um, what I'm trying to say is that I, I you know, there, there's been a conflict like between Howard and and uh, Dr. Mash about how how much responsibility people ought to be allowed to take for them, their own safety. Um, how much should be put in the hands of the elite. And even though I've been given a great privilege in terms of my education, in terms of my opportunity to learn things, especially in, in this gifted country we live in, um, I still believe that even people with very limited um, opportunities and limited education, even limited intelligence, still have to be responsible for themselves. They have to be responsible for their own suffering and their future and their choices. Um, they have to realize their own limitations and take responsibility for those. Everybody has to do that. And so uh, if I put a tool out there that could allow someone to hurt themselves with it and I do as, I'm as careful as I can to, to spell out what the risks are, just like on the pack of cigarettes, at some point, somebody has to take the ball and say, okay, you know, if I decide to go into my kitchen and, you know, order some online ibogaine from Africa and take that legal risk and then extract it and take that, that physical risk and then swallow it and take that medical risk, then I'm taking those risks. And if I hurt myself, it's my own risk that I'm taking and it's, you know, I'll deal with that. I'll take the, the bullet, so to speak. <laughs> um, that's the, the way I like the world to be run. I'd like people to see them, themselves that way, to empower them, to be that empowered. Uh, but uh, anyway, I came here to talk about chemistry. Um, and I first got interested in this when I saw a um, article in a magazine. Uh, but the article <coughs> was about um, the the therapeutic aspects of taking ibogaine, and that got me interested because I. I like the, you know, I'm interested in the therapeutic, therapeutic aspects of, of um, many psychoactive compounds. Uh, so I got in contact with uh, Eric Taub in Florida, who had authored the uh, article, and he got me in touch with his friend Carl in Italy, who was trying to get ibogaine to treat people for addiction. He had a small practice. He was a chiropractor by trade, uh, but he uh, wanted to be able to help a few people to get ibogaine. And he actually paid my way out to um, Paris to start my studies there, to do initial extraction studies. And that was the first uh, successful extraction that I had. All I had to go on was an old um, article by, by someone named Dickel, I think it's 1980 or so, maybe earlier. Uh, who had done some extraction on Tabernet Ibogaine. And his extraction was very standard for a chemist. He took the material, and I think he might have even used a standard Soxlid extractor, which is a, basically, it's a big, uh, a thimble they call it, but it's a, it's a thing, you know, it's a porous container that you can fill up with a plant material or anything else, and you put it under a stream of solvent that's condensing from a condenser where it's being condensed from a, a boiling flask below. So you've got a flask below that's boiling solvent. It, the vapor is condensing above. The liquid is running into what you're trying to extract. It's running out of the porous container back into the vessel. And so basically anything that dissolves gets concentrated down here in the boiling container. This is called a Soxlid extraction. It's a very standard method of, of, a, of removing 
things that dissolve in organic solvents from plant material. So you separate soluble things from the mat, you know, the 95% that doesn't dissolve, um, which is good in general for extracting natural products. And my fear when I went to um, Paris was that I would have to follow the same general procedure and that that's all I would have to give to Carl because I mean, a solid extractor can be run, but then you're still left with everything that dissolved in the solvent that you used, which is usually a complex mixture of in which if you boil off the solvent, you're left with this gunk. And then what do you do with that? So um, I was very fortunate in that one week to, I, I just tried, you know, I, I tried to, the simplest thing. I tried extracting with vinegar. And the reason I picked vinegar, I think there was something in the article about using acetic acid at some point. But um, I just, I, I wanted to stick to things I knew Carl could get. I know it's easier to get vinegar than to get hydrochloric acid, even though they're both pretty available. So I stuck, I, I tried vinegar first. Uh, and the point of the vinegar, I'm gonna have to get a little, a couple slides in to actually show how that, how that uh, is used. but. It dissolves alkaloids, and alkaloids are plant substances that are bitter. They contain nitrogen, they're basic, and so they react with acids. And when they do, they make a salt which dissolves in water, or at least almost always. And uh, so my, my goal here was to use the sour vinegar to, extract, to dissolve the bitter, the bitter ibogaine out of the iboga bark that Carl had uh, milled for me. And when now, now when I did that, actually, the, probably, I think some of the first experiments I did with that wasn't even with vinegar. It was might might have been with lemon juice. And I had a host in Paris. Uh, Carl wasn't able to stay during my visit. Uh, my uh, oh shoot, I don't remember his name. Dennis, I think it might, it might have been. And uh, he had a, a tiny apartment in Paris, and uh, he let me stay there during my work. And um, I used vinegar to extract the um, the root, and and to, to, to just to make sure it would work, we extracted the lemon juice, and then I made use the, uh, the the well ran it through a strainer to get the the pulp away from the the juice. And then we just drank it as a tea. What's that? Mm -hmm. Well, this is another aspect I share in common with Dr. Shulgin. In tandem with taking personal responsibility, I like to be the first to uh, take the medicine before asking anybody else to uh, be as courageous. So, um, uh, well, I, 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 I don't remember when, at what point Dennis uh, joined me in my tea consumption, but we uh, basically shared this tea. I found it exceedingly bitter. It's uh, uh, extremely difficult to drink this this uh, bitter tea. But he said it was oh, it's much like the teas I'm used to. It's not that bad. <laughs> but, so even even before it was, you know, we had found any psychoactive effects, there's big individual variations in response to ibogaine. <laughs> Um, but that, that experiment found that it was psychoactive. And so, okay, so I know that some some or all of the ibogaine is dissolving in lemon juice. Great, good start. So then I tried boiling it in lemon juice or vinegar and filtering it through coffee filter. And the idea there is I wanted to filter, separate all the solids from my uh, from from the liquid part. I wanted to not just separate the big pieces of, of root like we had in the tea and let the rest settle or drink it, but I wanted to you know, separate the liquid ideally, but I found it wouldn't filter. Because what happened is when, when I boiled it with the root, it made kind of a, um, a gel or you know, it, it made some um, fine solid that plugged the pores in the paper. Chemists are always dealing with little salties like this and having to find workarounds and that was you know, a common problem. And I was um, a little, you know, I, I, thought of it, I thought it was desperate at the time, but I thought, well, for now, I'm not going to try boiling the root. I will try just stirring the root with vinegar at room temperature for a while, and then filtering. And then I found it filtered. 
very good news. I was able to filter it by not boiling it. So now I have a solution of ibogaine in the, the vinegar. And then I needed to try to um, isolate this ibogaine, or at least some form of it that would be, that, we could, that could be stored. Uh, I guess, we, you know, we could go around with extracts, but that wasn't what I was looking for. I, you know, I, I'd like to have some kind of a solid, something that could be shipped more easily than bark itself. Um, and some, hopefully something that's more convenient to take than bulk bark. I mean, you know, there, there's practical goals for this work I'm doing for Carl. It's to make it so that people uh, don't have the physical uh, intimidation of having a pile of shredded bark in a, on a, in a bowl in front of them if, if for a treatment, like they would have to do if they went to the buidi. Uh Or the taste of having to swallow a gram and a half of ibogaine in solution when the TI drank was only a tenth that much and it was very hard to get that down. And if it causes nausea during the drinking, that would make it much more difficult. Um, so I needed to get it as a solid. Um, I thought I'd put a base in the, um, in the acid solution to make it so that the ibogaine, which is basic, wouldn't want to dissolve in water because the way it works is that these Organic molecules, which have nitrogen in them, um, the alkaloids, they tend to dissolve in acid but not in base because the acid um, b combines with the nitrogen atom to make it so that it's charged. And that makes the water molecules want to stick around it. And that bunch of water molecules sort of pulls it out of the, you know, away from the other molecules and helps it to stay in solution the way that soap does. So, another story, but it's it's like a big... The way that, that soap ever, ever gets into water, because if it weren't for just the end of the soap molecule, it would be just like oil. It's basically oil with one end of the soap made so it has a charge. And that little charge is able to pull it away from the rest of the soap molecules and get it so that it's in the water. Um, anyway, I added ammonia to the vinegar extract. Now, when I say vinegar, I mean white vinegar, which is pure acetic acid. It's distilled vinegar. And so I'm using the pure stuff so that we won't have any complications. I added ammonia to it and I got a... it turned brown and murky. Now what I expected to happen here, from my experience as a chemist after getting a PhD and out of, you know, just general experience, what would normally happen is that it would turn brown and murky and then as I sat, it would start to get darker, and then the droplets would coalesce and form a black sludge on the side of the container. And if I, I could either wait for it all to settle and pour off the water and be left with a, a, a sludge or an oil or a gum stuck to the container, or I could add a solvent that doesn't dissolve in water to extract that oil away. That's what I expected to happen, but what actually happened, I really consider to be, you know, divine, a di you know, a divine intervention. You know, it was kind of like I had come out of, I wasn't being paid for this. I was doing this because I wanted to help, and I really felt like uh, I was being met in that effort uh, by some extremely, extremely good fortune in the result of that uh, process. The uh, brown suspension that I got was actually a solid a fluffy brown solid that it was it took a while to filter took a day but it eventually I was able to filter it through a coffee filter rinse it with a bit of water and set it on the counter to dry when it dried it dried into a crusty brown solid that could be crushed up and powdered and stored and it turned out to be stable and so that's the big success right there that's my main contribution to ibogaine really is that amazing piece of good fortune but I actually have a slideshow, which I'll try to go through and, and uh, keep with. Um, the goals in, when I, when I tried to refine that procedure and, and extend it, the goals I had in mind were what I have here, to ensure there's enough ibogaine for everyone who wants it for treatment, kind of in line with Howard's goal. Uh, let ibogaine be affordable for everyone who wants it. See, it, it, it was difficult for me to get motivated. The, the one big barrier to trying to do research to find cures for addiction is people think, well, 
if someone tried hard enough, they could get Ibogaine, you know? Even if it were $10,000 a gram, at least it's available if you just had enough money. Um, or, you know, if you were willing to go far enough, you could find a legal environment in which to take it. You know, all these these things. But the, the, the fact is, Howard didn't take it. Well, he took it in a place where it would be illegal to take it now. But he was still cured. Um, and... If you're going to look at most, I, I, would, I don't know what the proportion of addiction is in developing countries compared to the developed ones. We're always thinking of Europeans and Americans when we talk about Ibogaine treatment. But the fact is there's a lot of, you know, most of the world is not living like Europeans and Americans. There's a lot of addicted people in India and places like that. And they have even bigger problems because not only is, um, do they not have money, but in, in some societies, especially the Muslim societies that are very large. It's also very, um, the, you know, they have the uh, additional stigmas to even being addicted in the first place, much less seeking treatment. Uh, so there's, uh, I think there's a real um, benefit that can be made by lowering that barrier as much as possible uh, and making Ibogaine as available as possible throughout the world. Um, Allow ibogaine to be produced in all places, and that's what I mean. Developing, including developing countries. And there, I'm talking about okay. Even if the ibogaine is cheap enough somewhere else, I want them. You know, I, I want someone to theoretically. You know, I had a doctor who worked at a methadone treatment uh, clinic in Pakistan contact me about 10 years ago, asking for ibogaine. I wasn't really able to help him ex except more just talk. <coughs> but I want him to be able to, you know ideally find a species that he can grow so that he can be in full control of his ibogaine production if he couldn't afford to buy the ibogaine which is certainly the case right now because he's living in pakistan and most people in pakistan very have very little i've been there um then i would i, I would want him to be empowered to provide that for his patients so I set these, you know, these are kind of the way I, I see the goals for my research method. I mean, those are the overall reasons why I'm doing the work. But as far as a good method, uh, ibogaine extraction from tarbinanth iboga is one possible way of getting ibogaine, if, if we're just talking about ibogaine itself for treatment. So these are the goals I'd have for that method. Uh, it should be inexpensive. Uh, the method should be easy and safe to reproduce about without uh, professional chemical training. This, what I've talked about so far, extraction with vinegar, basification with ammonia, I think that people here can feel pretty comfortable with that. Um, make use of materials and available, equipment available most places in the world. Well, that's why I selected those to start with. I mean, I was willing, I'd bought things like dichloroethylene in the hardware store in Paris you know, to do other re experiments if I had to, you know, do something fancier. And I'm sure glad that my methods don't depend on that solvent. The ibogaine should be produced in a stable form. Uh, thank God the, I, the alkaloid that, that was isolated seems to be stable for years. Uh, Indra is an example. It, Indra is probably pretty much... Uh, it's probably the same thing as this alkaloid that I made. I'm not sure if they used a similar method or not, but um, it's probably a similar mixture, and that's why it has lasted these decades. Uh, impurities present in the ibogaine should not contribute to significant side effects. Well, if you're on the ibogaine list, you've had plenty of time to see the debate about which is better, pure ibogaine or you know, iboga with its centuries of use. But um, that can become an addition, that can be, become a more complicated um, issue when we talk about getting <coughs> ibogaine from sources other than uh, iboga. Waste produced by the process should not damage the environment. Well, so far, vinegar and ammonia, even on a very large scale, are appreciated by the environment. The demands of production should not endanger the species providing the ibogaine. Okay, now that I thought was divine providence that your talk sort of was centering on that because that that's actually the most important part of what I'm presenting here is um, my work right now is to try to wean the world off Tarpanath Iboga because I am worried about its sur its continued survival as a species because of the you know hopefully ever increasing well not ever increasing but uh, increasing to full uh, you know the, the, to the point where everybody can get it 
So I want uh, there to be a plant that can provide it. These are the kinds of methods that um, I currently see producing ibogaine itself. Now, I, I, I want someone to remind me if I don't bring it up that ibogaine is just what we've discovered off the cuff. I mean, that's what Howard haphazardly discovered. It isn't necessarily the best thing for treating addiction. It's just the first thing that was discovered for treating addiction. It may be that something slightly different would be better. I mean, nobody knows because nobody's tried. But um, I would be very surprised if that particular configuration of atoms just happens to be perfect. Um, this, uh, this is the this is this very simple thing is the thing I did in Paris where I, well, I didn't even make ibogaine. Really, what I really did was reduce this brown pile into a smaller brown pile. <laughs> very significant. I, that's like 95% of that brown pile went away. That's a real purification. I, I, I made this ibogaine go from about 3% pure. Actually, it was whole roots. So it was about 1% pure to something like 30%. That's a massive purification. <laughs> Okay, the second uh, possibility I'm hoping to shoot for next is a semi-synthesis from Volkanga. Now, this, isn't, this is nothing new, and you'll see a patent later here from the 50s where a very uh, visionary Frenchman had uh, already proposed what we're already issue, grappling with today. But what this involves is extracting the chemical Volkanga from trunk or root bark from the Volkanga tree the Volkanga africana tree or a related species because they actually uh, share some of, there's more than one species with vo significant Volkanga, which is very fortunate compared to, to the Iboga species, which is pretty much alone. The uh, Volkanga is relatively easily converted to Ibogaine. I say that as a synthetic chemist. The process for this conversion gives a good yield. It doesn't require high technology. The technology is similar to that for the preparation of soap from uh, animal fat. Why don't you explain that? I will in the next slides. Okay. This, I'm not going to talk much about this because even though this is my training, I'm most, uh, foremost a practical person. I want to make things work the best that they can. And right now, thank goodness, the uh, Tabernacle Ibogaine is not extinct. The Volkanga is an alternative. And we don't have to rely on uh, using benzene or oil or smoke or something like that to try to as a starting source for something to make ibogaine from, which would be much more expensive and difficult. And uh, it, it would require a lot of people to depend on a few big companies. I'd like to show some people I worked with. Uh, these are, most of these pictures came from my work in South Africa and the wonderful uh, volunteers who helped uh, me work on this. Uh, extraction. This is, this lady is pouring, she's measuring out uh, two, two kilograms of powdered iboga root bark, uh, root bark. This is the good stuff here. And the reason she's wearing a dust mask is it's so finely powdered that she, the uh, that it's actually, you can actually taste it. It's amazing. You, if you're in the room when this is being measured, you get a bitter flavor in your mouth from the iboga dust that you inhale. And your, your sinuses taste bitter. <laughs> um, Do you get high? No. Any no, but that's a good... Effect? What's that? Any therapeutic effect in that amount? No, no. but it's a good question. I mean... Um, I actually have a little experience as a toxicologist too. So there's a saying we have as a toxicologist that it's the dose that makes the poison. There's a big difference in, in a few milligrams of iboga bark compared to a few grams of ibogaine. Much big diff uh, much different uh, situation. Um, it reminds me of, of something my dad once said. Well, you know, I was talking about how some people uh, said they could get high off nutmeg. Yeah. Not that I recommend it. It's yeah. it's not very popular even. Jailhouse. Yeah, exactly. You'd have to be in jail to be that desperate. Coffee, 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 coffee. But his question was, why? if that's true, why is it I don't get high when I put it on my, my, my uh, eggnog? And there, there's the answer. It's, the, it's the, the amount. You know, if you choose several of these nuts, then perhaps you'll get something out. But nobody does that by accident. Um, so you, um, 
this is way, it's, that, it's not that it has to be uh, really precision, but we're, you know, this is kind of a, a halfway uh, research slash production we're doing right here. Because what I'm doing in these pictures is I'm training these people to do this production method. So not only are they getting the experience, but we're also, this is a fresh batch of root that we just got. We don't know uh, how much ibogaine is in it. We don't even know if it's the right stuff at first. So we need to quantify that. And the only way we can make sure we can see how good it is is to weigh things out. So what we got here is a, uh, I guess it's like a $30 kitchen scale or something. In the United States, we're very blessed to have cheap electronics. Everybody can afford a lot of really nice technology. Uh, in this country. Um, yeah, and these were two, two kilogram batches of 20 kilogram barrel. That's what we're starting with for our research. Oh, and, and speaking of which, when I, when I, when I read the Dickel paper before the, all this started, <laughs> the one where the Iboga was extracted, he had, done, he had actually isolated about a kilogram of, of uh, Ibogaine in France at some point back in the 60s or 70s. I always wondered where that went, you know? This is some, and this, the the reason this paper was written, it wasn't to obtain ibogaine. This was a natural product researcher. What, what drove, drove him was just exploration of plant species. He was interested in quantifying what's in plants. He wanted to show, you know, this is the list of, of things that this plant contains, so if you want any of those things, you better not kill off the species, uh, and if you want, you know, this is where you find them. So he set aside the kilogram of ibogaine. Oh, that's interesting, and went to quantify the little, you know, the the less free uh, bonded alkaloid. So he, he worked on you know a large quantity of the bark because it was around back then, you know, and you know it wasn't there was no need, you know, not a lot of competition for it, and he needed a lot of bark to get a little bit of the little trace things that he wanted to identify just to show that they were there. So that's academic research for you. Take a kilogram of ibogaine and let it collect dust and. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you can see that, that um, um, what's her name again? I know her name, Debra. 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 Yeah, Debra's having a good time. And what she's stirring this with is a piece of scrap wood that my host's house had sitting next to it. This is appropriate technology. It works. Um, this paper towel is around there to keep the splinters from getting in our hands. We, we actually upgraded to bamboo poles. <laughs> But this is a plastic bucket. We got like 20 of these for a production process. Um, and this is the two kilograms of root, and it has about five liters of diluted vinegar in it. We took, uh, we went down to the grocery store and bought four or five, I think four or five liter um, jugs of distilled vinegar, which is 5% acetic acid. And for each bucket of bark, like this, we would take half a liter of that and dilute it ten tenfold in this bucket and then stir it. And over an hour, we'd stir occasionally. So that's where I say here, let's see, use this diluted vinegar, stir a few times over an hour. Now, what was the initial weight of the bark that you put in the bucket? Uh, two kilograms? Yes, two kilograms? these are two kilogram batches. I should, I should, this, um, you, someone might have all already thought at this point. Now, how do I know that this? You know, I, I the, you know, why did I boil the first time in France? Why did I boil the bark with vinegar when I could have just done room temperature? Because that's easier. You know, why bother to heat it? Why do we boil water when we make tea? Well, because it's more efficient. We worry about not extracting out all the caffeine and flavor if we don't boil our water when we make the tea. Um, so I was, you know going with the same wisdom. And so we have the same concern here. If we use room temperature vinegar, are we really getting out all the ibogaine? After my um, week in Paris, the reason that only lasted a week is I was in the middle of graduate school. But after I finished graduate school, Carl was generous enough to take care of me for half a year. I think, I think it was six months in Italy in his apartment. He shared his apartment with me uh, as I refined this method. And during that time, you know, I, I worked on the scale and, and figured out just how much vinegar, how dilute, you know. The idea was get out all the ibogaine, make sure it's all out, and then make sure we're getting it all back when we have the ammonia. That's basically it. And I did a lot of work making sure this 
thing is actually not wasting ibogaine. That would be a, a crime against nature. Um, yeah, the next step, once you stir that for an hour, which seems to be adequate for, for reaching an, you know, an equilibrium where you're not going get, to get out any more ibogaine, is you pour this muck into a, well, what we're using here is a pillowcase for a filter. When I was with Carl, he had the bag. It was some cloth cotton bag he had come up with that just worked really well for this filtration. He had suggested I was using paper. But boy, I sure am glad he turned me on to using a bag for filtration because it, if we couldn't wring it out, it would take forever and we'd never, how would we ever press anything? This is hard work here. I mean, I guess when we scale it up, you know, nobody's going to, this was the hardest thing to get people to do because it really, you know, oh, you have to do this over and over again, and you're you're holding this wet, stinky, vinegar-scented bag while trying to twist the bag, and then someone else has to crush the bag to get out of the liquid. The liquid ends up down here in this bucket, and then the pulp gets poured back into the original bucket that the extraction was done in. Um, you end up with a process that looks like this. Uh, here's Anwar. The reason he's wearing the the the, the mask, it's the, the dust doesn't stay around long after the uh, weighing. The reason he's wearing the mask is, is uh, it's a personal protest against the ammonia. <laughs> when you deal with larger than teaspoon amounts of ammonia, it stinks up the whole place. And unlike me, other people don't find pleasure in a room full of ammonia. And uh, I don't know why they thought these dust masks were helping, but they swore that it <laughs> didn't stink as bad with that. Um, so anyway, when you get to a large scale, you need ventilation. That's, Something they're working on, I'm sure. They're making us high. <laughs> it's one another thing I found as a toxicologist: the liver uh, does an extremely efficient job of removing ammonia. Because just as diapers smell like ammonia, so would your intestines if it weren't for the liver constantly removing ammonia from your bloodstream. And ammonia is very neurotoxic. It's why people, on, you know, with, with their liver about to fail, get uh, mental problems. The ammonia is actually starting to damage the brain. It's, it's very bad, but it, it's taken right out of the bloodstream by the liver. The reason that, okay, what we're doing here is this is the root pulp and, uh, and vinegar. And here's two buckets with pillowcases, which by divine providence perfectly fit the buckets. <laughs> and we're planning to pour this into each of these two to wring them out because we found that two, actually it was a two or two and a half kilograms. I think it was two kilograms, but it was uh, getting awfully heavy because of the amount of liquid also involved. It was just too much hard work trying to wring that out in one go. And so we poured it into two separate buckets. So we only had to deal with half of it at a time. That was about the right amount. This bucket has some freshly weighed out root. That's two, two kilograms coming up. So what we do here is a, 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 you know, a, a assembly line process. You know, try to make it more efficient. After adding ammonia to the water and filtering out the alkaloid, you can only, it's never going to be perfect. Chemistry is never quite perfect. There's always going to be a little bit of ibogaine dissolved in the water that goes through when you filter out the alkaloid. The more water you have, you'd expect the more alkaloid there's going to be dissolved in it. You know, if you scale it up, things tend to multiply. So minimizing the amount of water that we're using should, should minimize that loss. Uh, so what we're doing here is we're taking this, this has actually already been extracted once, the root pulp that's in this bucket. So what I've got here is root that's already been extracted. So this is, you know, kind of a weak extract of ibogaine. And we're going to filter that out and then use that weak extract to extract the root to make a strong extract. So that way we use the same vinegar twice. Yeah, I keep saying root, but I mean bark in this case, although uh, powdered, as long as it's finely powdered, uh, root is, is just fine. It's just a matter of the inconvenience of having to wring a bigger bag, but it would get it all out eventually anyway. And the, it should be obvious the advantage of, of using whole root is that you don't have to hire somebody to carve your root bark off the root, which isn't a very... Uh, it's not like some plants where it just shakes off. This is not a, a pleasant separation process. This is what it looks like when you add the ammonia. That was the, the miracle that I saw in Paris, this beautiful brown uh, elixir. 
And this is a, this is a uh, you can buy this as coffee filter made for commercial coffee makers. You can have this. This is a big coffee paper. And when you pour this into here. So it's a double. No, no, that's a single piece. There's not really a need for two pieces. Fortunately, yeah, it, it comes through pretty clear. The first little bit may be cloudy. It tends not to be a real loss, but if you're always worried about that, you could always take the first little bit and pour it back in because the paper pours clog, it becomes a more efficient filter after the first little bit. Downside of that, the filtration rate plummets after the first bit. So when you fill this up and it goes it goes to half, you know, it drains halfway in the first 20 minutes. You fill it up again, it drains halfway in the next three hours. You fill it up again, it takes four hours. So what you're looking at is the floor of the apartment I stayed in during my, uh, my couple weeks in South Africa. Because the reason I wanted to stay there, a large benefit of me being living in this laboratory was that I could get up in the middle of the night and refill this funnel. <laughs> that made it faster. And this stuff isn't, you know, necessarily, this is a dilute solution. It, uh, and this one's especially bad. It's not immune from bacterial contamination. I mean, I, I hardly ever had this problem, but when I was doing the research in Italy and sometimes we'd uh, let things sit, it, it, it's conceivable this could actually eventually rot. So you don't let it sit there for a week in, the human, in a tropical uh, environment. We tried to get through this in a couple days to make sure that it would not... We, that's exact, That's why I bought 20 buckets <laughs> to go with the 20 funnels. <laughs> yeah, the room was filled with these little things, so it kept me busy, you know, topping off everything you know, all the time. I have a question about using plastic as well. Is there any possibility that anything might leach from the plastic and the ammonia and, and such? Is there preparation? Well, not that I've noticed. Well, then you have to worry about metal leaching out. Especially in the presence of acid. Yeah. You, yeah. Polypropylene is very inert rock glass or porcelain. So. Well, <laughs> there's all sorts of practical considerations, but I didn't notice a practical problem here. Another thing to consider is that even if a trace of something did leach out, suppose you worry about, um, you know, the, I forget what it's called that leaches out terraphenol or something like that when you microwave uh, uh, Tupperware or something like that. Um, even if it leached out into the water, then it would have to not stay dissolved when we had the ammonia, because otherwise it would wash through and be separated. Mm -hmm. Plus, what we're preparing here is an intermediate in further purification. Unless you eat this stuff, which is a possibility, um, you would have a further chance to separate out any contaminants later on in the process. So a lot of times, I mean, at this stage we were pretty messy. I was literally sweeping the floor and throwing it back into some of these extractions. <laughs> you just ask Carl how wow. stingy, how, 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 how often I dogged him and his team to not throw out any dirty filter papers or, <laughs> or wipings or spillings or anything like that because after all a gram of ibogaine lost is a person not treated. Here's what it looks like when the um, uh, suspension gets thrown into a bucket to filter. This is nice and slow. You can hear it dripping, and uh, I've grown extremely, I get extremely aroused by the smell of ammonia and vinegar at the same time, because it, all those years of, of pleasant memories come back. <laughs> Here's what the, you know, the sort of situation looks like. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole nother story. Now this is a, I think this is a bucket of, of what the, when you add ammonia to the, um, to the ibogaine solution, this is what it looks like after it's had a little chance to settle. And there's an advantage to that. If you let it settle for a while before pouring it in the filter, the clear liquid filters fast because it doesn't have particles to clog the filter paper. So you may be able to save, you know, the settling is slow too, but depending on, well, depending on how big your scale, you may save time letting it settle halfway, pouring clear liquid through the filter first, and then pouring the thicker stuff through last. Things to consider. After all the liquid is drained from that funnel, and it's 
been rinsed with water to get out the last bit of ammonia. I mean, this is, this is pretty nitpicky for me to even rinse out ammonia because the ammonia itself is going to evaporate. Uh, traces of whatever dissolved from the root really wouldn't matter, but I just like to be perfect. So I rinse it with water and let it drain. And then this is sitting on a, we actually went and got a, a, set, a set of light colored uh, cotton towels. So each time we got one of these papers, we'd put it in a basket and let it sit on a, a cotton towel so that water could leach out of this um, alkaloid, what I call the total alkaloid. Um, uh, that would help be sort of a pre-drying. And also, it seemed like some ibogaine may, uh, some alkaloid may also end up impregnating those towels over months of continuous uh, production. There's no reason these towels can't be thrown back in the buckets with the vinegar and, you know, that vinegar used to do extra extractions. I mean, you can always try to get out ibogaine that way. Um, there was even a case, uh, a good friend of mine, um, his name's Dave, he um, came to uh, Italy for a treatment and he was one of those people um, that they talk about, someone talked about being um, sort of ready uh, for the treatment, not you know, like a ripe fruit, not needing further post-treatment. He had been on methadone maintenance. He had tapered it down to like 21 milligrams, and it was interesting. He said that you could taper, he you could take, taper down to a certain amount. It was real easy to go from 200 down to 50, and then down to, down to 50, you know, down to 30 wasn't so bad. And then you know, but 30 down to 20, God, that was like one milligram at a time, and it was hell. But then he just couldn't get himself past 21. You know, it was just you know, he'd have to go through full withdrawal to do that. So he, 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 he was sure he wanted to get off. He'd go through it if he had to, but the ibogaine was a way to save himself that, that intense misery. And he, um, the reason I bring this up at this point is that during his treatment, which went very well, and it, like I say, he afterwards he did great things. But during his treatment, he threw up. And so, of course, like a good chemist, I rushed his vomit to the oh, filtration God. apparatus. Oh, my God. <laughs> 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 yeah, swallowing vomit is uh, the bar <laughs> terrible alternative. You know what? They do it in jail all the time. When people yeah. who, are, who get methadone in jail often will basically go and get their methadone throw it up, and then give it, share it with someone else. That's a lot, so. That's so much. That's so much. But anyway, the, what happened here, and I, this is actually practical information. What happened here is that I added ammonia to the filtrate. It precipitated a solid. Well, actually, I had to extract it. I don't remember if it precipitated a solid, but I extracted it out, evaporated down, got a solid, and we were able to put it in a gel cap and give it to his, his retreatment the next day. So he actually was able to retake it in a gel cap. So there's, there was no need to even waste that ibogaine. The solid you got was powder light, Well, that was ibogaine base that resulted from evaporating a petroleum ether solution of ibogaine. And so that was, it was crystalline, but it was a waxy solid. But it was able to be gel capped and weighed. As a base? We didn't tend to handle the base. We worked with total alkaloid, which dried to a powder, but was mostly inert material, or as the hydrochloride, which could be finely powdered. Yes. Well, this has an in, this is interesting. Uh, interesting texture. As it dries, it, it's uh, at this. Uh, this is drying most in the middle, or it's darkest. But on the outside, as it dries, it, you know, it starts to crack, kind of like the, the Midwest desert after a rain. But during that process, it gets the color and texture of chocolate. You can actually chop it up with a knife, and it's like chopping warm chocolate. And you do that in order to increase the surface area to, to you know, hasten the drying. And then uh, when it's fully dry, you end up with these curled up pieces that you have to sort of break off the paper. And they're extremely hard. Well, not extremely. You can crush them up, which we used a large mortar for. We'd pound them up in this mortar to break them up into smaller pieces that would fit inside a coffee grinder. which is on the next page. Let's see here. Uh, long, uh, it can take a long time to dry. This is a, one of those electric uh, forced air heaters, you know, very, very common and inexpensive. <coughs> um, 
We worried about the effect of heat, because I hadn't tried that before. I had always just set this on a radiator, which is still heat, but it wasn't quite this hot. This was, you know, like maybe a hand dryer or maybe even a hair dryer heat. Uh, but that didn't seem to do any harm. I just want people to know that because it can save a huge amount of time in this drying process. It's important to save time uh, because the, um, you know, it, it, yeah, it can mold and it can be a bottleneck to the process. You had a question? Uh, well, I suppose then you can also use a dehumidifier. Yes, that's the alternative. I thought I'd even put it on here. Yeah. And, uh, I had suggested that the uh, person to set up this lab get a uh, commercial food dehydrator, which would be kind of ideal for this kind of a process. But if you are in a, a tropical environment with uh, high moisture content in the air, and, and uh, even then heat would probably be sufficient. But uh, you know, if you wanted to, you could use a dehydrator, which would actually desiccate the air and use dry air to do the drying process, and that might be a good alternative. I don't mean to discourage any questions. In fact, I, you know, if we have time, I'd like to answer every question people have during the, the, the uh, show here. Um, much of the yeah, right. Yeah. What is this ibogaine we have made? I've been calling it ibogaine up in the titles <laughs> up to now. But I'm sure a lot of people, especially those who have eaten it, would like to know what is TA or total alkaloid. Um, it's one way to tell us by the next slides I'm going to show. It, it turns out half of it doesn't dissolve in acetone, which is the next step in the purification process. The TA can be used for treatment, and some people say, oh, I prefer TA as treatment. And there's a good argument for using the total alkaloid for, as the treatment. Now, as far as the toxicity of, of the total alkaloid compared to the ibogaine of the root, I can pretty much say with confidence that the TA will have about the same toxicity as the root. It's much less bulky, so you don't have as big an ordeal getting it down. I've, as one of the tests that I used to make sure the abogin was out of the bark, uh, aside from just extracting it and analyzing the extract, you know, with other solvents, was I actually ate root bark that had been thoroughly extracted by this method to prove that there was no psychoactivity left in the bark. I'm able to de determine that it has psychoactivity. You know, uh, I know my experience with ibogaine. It's not, a, it's not a very uh, visionary experience for me, but at least I can detect it. So I know what 100, 150 milligrams of ibogaine feels like, so I can put an upper limit on the amount of ibogaine I'm losing if I eat something like that. Now the TA, in the next step, it's extracted with acetone. I'll go on to that. Let's see, it's, uh, it's a mixture of substances in, that dissolve in vinegar but not ammonia. We know that by the process we went through. So basically, total alkylate is named that because it's uh, it's kind of it's kind of by nef by definition uh, 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 a total of all the things that dissolved in acid but not base, and those tend to be things with which have nitrogen in them in the molecule, which are basic, which are by definition alkaloids. Chris, yep. You said that's thirty percent ibogaine. The other seventy percent consists of. I'll go on to that. Let me uh, start with the, uh, here it is. Um, let me just say that half of the stuff doesn't dissolve in acetone, which will be the next step. If we wanted to purify this to make pure ibogaine for, for sticklers who don't want other alkaloids in their ibogaine, or less of them anyway, or something that has a more appealing appearance. Um, so that half it seems to be an alkaloid. It could be dimeric alkaloids because the voa conga, the iboga species, contain a lot of alkaloids that are like ibogaine but twice as big. They're like two ibogaines stuck together. Uh, those seem to have some heart action, according to patents I've seen on voa conga, but not psychoactivity. Um, what I found, though, when I myself ate the stuff in the TA that did not dissolve in the acetone, it seemed to have no effect at all. So it seems like it's uh, inactive. This is, this is the stuff that seems to be left in the uh, acetone that I know about. Now, I'm sure there's other alkaloids, but these are the ones that are known and that are similar to ibogaine. And these are important for yeah, what percentages? 
Yeah, these are important for a couple reasons. Uh, Dana wants to know what percentage is. Now this I am assuming that in what dissolves, see I said 30% in TA. Since half of it doesn't dissolve, that means that's about 60% in what dissolved. The second most abundant alkaloid uh, after ibogaine uh, seems to be ibogaline, but that's only in some strains in, of uh, the iboga. I, it, it seems that there's two subspecies of iboga. There's different shaped fruit. There's a rounder fruit, and then you showed a longer fruit, uh, a pointed fruit. Um, Carl actually treated me with some fresh fruit because we were going to try to grow the plant in Italy, and he had brought back root and some some of the actual aerial part, plant parts. So I, I know that the uh, fruit isn't particularly tasty. It's it's edible, but it's mostly seed. Um, but the uh, two different species subspecies. One of them seems to contain ibogaline and the other doesn't. That's the main difference. Uh, you can tell that with uh, what I'm going to show upcoming is an is a, uh, analysis technique to, 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 that shows these different alkaloids. You can see uh, where the ibogaline is. Um, but this is important in the effects of the ibogaine. Um, I actually had a chance to separate these two, which is why I'm so confident about the ibogaline being the second most predominant alkaloid is because I actually separated it out from a mixture of these things. Um, and waste not, want not. After analysis, of course, I had to try it. At, um, I got about 125 milligrams of ibogaline. And at that dose, it was about two or three times the potency of, potency of ibogaine. I couldn't really distinguish the effects that much. Maybe it was a little longer, but uh, I'd say, you know, it seemed like two or three times the potency. Uh, so that's important for people considering the alkaloid mixture versus the pure ibogaine. The alkaloid mixture, uh, you know, like in uh, the TA, if you don't count the half that's inert, it'll actually be more potent because it has some more potent ibogaline going with the ibogaine. But on the other hand, since the effects were about the same, it's not necessarily uh, going to have major side effects. So Chris, the TA is 30% ibogaine, 20% uh, other ibogaloids, and 50% inert? Well, I, I should have gone, I don't know how to go back here. No, oh, that works. Okay. Um, I'm guessing in TA that you've got 30% ibogaine. It's hard to do the math. I mean, I'm just guessing, but this is, seems to be about um, what, what? That's based on the size of the spots when you did the thin layer chromatography? I should just go to that, yeah. Yeah, this is the thin layer chromatography where I labeled the ibogaine as the big spot here. And this is the TA, but I want to point out that half of it didn't dissolve in the salt that I applied to this place. So this is only of what dissolves. Um, the ibogaine spot is the big one. This is one of the next biggest, and that's ibogaline there, with the two oxygens on it. Now, um, what, what's special about this chromatogram, let me read this. this um, it shows the components separated into different spots. The way this works is you apply the sample down here, you put this in a bottle of solvent, which in this case was a mixture of ethyl acetate and petroleum ether, and the solvent climbs up this, this piece of plastic which has basically fine sand uh, glued to the front of it. It's not even glued, it's, it's barely attached. And uh, what happens is that the solvent pushes up what, what was uh, applied here. It dissolves it and pushes it along, but different components of the mixture stick to the fine sand, the silica, silica gel, uh, to different degrees. So the ibogaine didn't stick very much at all. The ibogamine, which I, I'm pretty sure that spot is even less, but ibogaline stuck to it more, which actually would be expected from its chemical structure. It's more polar, like silica gel, and so it sticks to it better. Um, but what's, uh, what, what's special about ibogaline, it, it just uh, physically, uh, when you look at the slide, you can't quite see it here. It was stained with, I with iodine vapor, which makes it yellow, so that you can see these spots. They absorb the, I the, I the iodine vapor. As the iodine evaporates, the ibogaline actually gives it a different color. It actually ends up pink color, where the, the other spots stay oh, brown. So you can distinguish the ibogaline from all the other alkaloids. I think the reason it does that is because of these, these two oxygens here. I think they, they coordinate to I iodine and make a complex, and that's actually giving it a color. 
So that's kind of special. Um, let's see. I've said that in half the time. Go ahead. So I've covered. Anyway, that's what. This is a technique for for anybody who's considering going out and buying ibogaine root, or who wants to prove that their root contains ibogaine, or has a sample of ibogaine. Ideally, to do this with, this is a very um, robust analysis technique for a sam you, All you have to do is take a little pinch of the the bark or the root powder or or shreds, put it in a little container with a little bit of solvent. Apply a little drop of the solvent right here and do the rest of what I said. And you can ana analyze this. You could do this out in uh, in a hut in Gabon. So it, you know this is a practical method here, uh, and it could save you from buying bad root. Okay, this is a coffee grinder I was talking about here. I'm powdering up the. Uh, the TA, and this is what it looks like when it's done. It's just, it doesn't look quite as nice as on my screen. On that screen, it's kind of a, uh, it looks kind of like cocoa powder. It looks just like cocoa powder. And, uh, you know, it, it's the same stuff, but it sure looks nice. Um, and it's inert. You can bottle that and store it, or you can put in gel caps, treat with it. Um, that works, although I'm not sure if there's a better way to use it than that for treatment or not. But anyway, that's... Uh, that is one possible stopping point. Or you can continue on with a purification method. To uh, The idea here is to try to get uh, something closer to basically what, you know, the, the holy grail, which is, or uh, as my host put it, the, uh, the real McCoy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something crystalline, uh, or less brown anyway. For some reason, people have trouble with brown chemicals. But, uh, Anyway, what we're doing here is extracting with acetone. It is satisfying because the first thing that happens is you separate out half of the stuff as garbage efficiently. You know, you don't seem to lose the ibogaine uh, by doing this. So it, uh, that's a good thing. You do lose a little uh, later on, but um, now this is, this is as the process continues, adding the acetone. It, we, we stir carefully. This filtration actually takes a little while. It's maybe 20 minutes. Um, so you have plenty of time to stir and make sure all the powder comes in contact with the acetone, get all the ibogaine out. Use plenty, enough acetone to get all of the uh, ibogaine dissolved from the solid. This is actually a carefully <coughs> measured amount because of the next step. Oh, and this is what's left behind. You evaporate the acetone and it seems to leave an inert garbage that we can't use. Um, oh, uh, an interesting uh, thing is I, I was saving this stuff in a bottle in Italy, and I went back to look at it. It had grown mold on the dried powder in the bottle. And that surprised me very much, because I always thought of this as alkaloid. It's, a, you know, it's like a chemical. It can't grow mold. How do you get you know, this? You know, it's like finding, you know, uh, I don't know. Uh, cream of tartar with more mold on it. This doesn't make sense. The next step is where we precipitate the solution of the iboga alkaloids, which are mostly ibogaine at this point, with hydrochloric acid. This is concentrated hydrochloric acid. It's 30% uh, hydrochloric acid gas dissolved in water. It's actually, uh, you, you may have already seen it in the hardware stores in the United States used to uh, clean uh, concrete. It's amazingly cheap. It's like three bucks a gallon. I mean, it's so you can get huge amounts, but we only need a tiny bit. We're starting off with just a little squirt. We add it, we wait, because we want to make sure what comes out of here is a solid. If it starts to come out as a liquid, we want to make sure it's solid and it comes out slowly because that maximizes the purity. And I'll show the slides rather quickly here because it goes through the process as more hydrochloric acid is being added and as the stirred uh, mixture of uh, iboga, uh, uh, what we call the purified total alkaloid, which is about 70 or 80 percent ibogaine as it comes out. So we're starting to add hydrochloric acid and you can see it coming out here. And there it is all added. And at this point I like to put it in the refrigerator for a few hours just to make sure that all of, you know, because there is some stuff dissolved in the acetone. 
The idea here is that ibogaine hydrochloride doesn't like to dissolve in acetone, and it isn't something I thought of. It's something that um, came out of Dickel's paper. He used acetone in a process like this to purify the ibogaine. So he uh, gave us this this piece of beautiful purification here. This is the good stuff that well, most people are getting treated with these days, I believe, the PTA hydrochloride, uh, which is mostly ibogaine hydrochloride. Uh, after sitting in the refrigerator, it uh, has precipitated about as much as possible from the solution, and it filters nicely as the yellow solid. On the first slide, that yellow powder I showed, this stuff, is what the PTA looks like. And uh, I'm not sure I could tell PTA from ibogaine. I really don't think I could if I were given, I mean, other than the appearance. If I were given a capsule of each with it, I couldn't see the powder, I don't think I'd be able to tell. This dries really quickly, so this is a nice end of the process. But, like I said, there's still stuff dissolved in the acetone. So here's, here's our nice brown acetone down here filtering from the TA. And it would be a real, there's actually significant ibogaine in that, but the ibogaine's a lot less pure now. I like to, um, when people think about, you know, a lot, there's been a lot of wasted time debating the purity of ibogaine in this process. And I like to uh, compare that with uh, the purity of caffeine in coffee. People don't worry about their caffeine being pure when they drink coffee or tea. Neither do they worry about sugar being terribly pure. Uh, you know, brown sugar's fine. Even molasses will do. And this is sort of the equivalent of, of uh, iboga molasses down here. We know that iboga root is not particularly toxic because the buidi seem to be able to tolerate it about as well as people have been able to tolerate ibogaine. So, that suggests that these things down here wouldn't be much more dangerous than the root itself if not used in much larger amount than they're present in the original root. Of course, if you concentrate something bad, as we know from uh, the cocaine ep epidemic, it can uh, lead to uh, you know, a problem that didn't exist before. So by concentrating these things, it does pose a risk of taking more than you could before, but that doesn't mean it's not, not necessarily useful. Uh, the, idea, the ideal would be, able to be to be able to separate these alkaloids, but since that technology is a little bit more expensive than what I've gone through so far, the next best thing would be able to store them or, you know, save them or, you know, may be, able, be able to make use of them in a limited fashion until that becomes available. The, the process for doing that involves distilling off the acetone. Here's our High-tech still, that's just the perfect technology for this scale. Um, this takes maybe an hour to distill down. And I'd like to point out that the distilled acetone may have a little water in it from the hydrochloric acid, but after drying it, there's no reason it can't be reused. So the waste streams here haven't gotten any worse than they were. The, uh, you know, again, I, you know, the, the total alkaloid filtrate can be thrown out. Certainly the the stuff from vin the filtering out the TA, the vinegar and acetone, that's fertilizer. I mean, plants love ammonia. That's what they use for fertilizer. Uh, a lot of the fertilizer you buy to put on the garden is, is ammonium salt. So you just pour that on the garden, it'll be great. Uh, and by reusing the acetone here, we solved that problem. Now, I kind of skipped a step here, but you, after getting rid of the acetone, you have to dissolve this oil that's, that's a bunch of hydrochlorides in water and then add ammonia. And you get this here, which is just like the brown stuff from the original root extraction. It's a, a, sus a brown suspension. This is like a, a second gift, just like that first one we got when the TA came out as a solid. This beautiful R, eh? the, re the residual alkaloid, a recovered alkaloid, uh, it also happens to be a solid. It's different than the TA, though. It's weird. It's, it's just like chalk. It's, this, it's like meringue. It's this light crunchy solid, but it's also very stable and it's always a solid and you can put it in a bottle and keep it and it doesn't seem to degrade, so it's beautiful. Uh, and here's my guesstimate of what the composition is from TLC. It seems to me maybe 40% ibogaine, but it represents about a quarter of the ibogaine that was in the original root. So if you, if you, if you insist on using PTA hydrochloride 
for treatment instead of TA, the price you have to pay is a quarter of your ibogaine is going to be uh, fossilized in a form that can't be used until uh, we find a use for it. Now this also contains, a, uh, it has, it, this has been enriched in those other alkaloids like ibogaline and tabernanthine and ibogamine. And one thing I'd like to, like everyone to listen to is that ibogaine isn't necessarily the perfect addiction treatment. You know, 18MC has been held up as an alternative, but ibogaline, I can say from experience, is active. Um, it may be a better treatment or maybe not. I believe it causes tremors, so maybe not. But ibogamine has been said not to have caused tremors. So it's supposed to, and it's also been said to treat, it's to treat addiction in rats. So maybe ibogamine is the alkaloid that would be better than ibogaine. These things are all sitting here in, hopefully, hopefully people have been going to this effort all these years since I first published and uh, have been saving this up. So we've got a bunch of recovered alkaloid that we can recover ibogamine from if that happens to be so great. Um, Anthony? Anthony? Anthony, any thoughts about uh, tabernanthine? Yeah, that was actually a compound that was included in the original C. Uh, Tabern oh, tabernanthine. Tabernanthine. You know, that seems to be the least abundant alkaloid, but you're right, that, that's a possibility. And if it turned out to be the best treatment, then the challenge would be to find another way to get it. It probably wouldn't be the best source to get it from ibogamine. Maybe there's another plant with it or a better uh, a way to make it from something else, uh, like we'll talk about in a minute, for ibogaine. I have a quick question. Yes? Yes? Yes. But then um, try to precipitate alkaloids out with ammonia. Um, would that work? And what kind of process would you have if you did that? Good, very good question. I don't understand why I haven't gotten around to trying that because I, I even though theoretically all of the TA should redissolve in the vinegar, because I, I kind of wonder, first of all, if the TA, there might be some solid, because we're using pillowcases for, for filtration here. Maybe some of the TA is just root solid. Of course, that wouldn't do any harm, so it wouldn't be that big a benefit to trying to get it out. But uh, even, even if it's not, um, I'm kind of personally suspicious that, not all, that all the uh, TA would redissolve. And if it didn't redissolve in vinegar, then you would actually be able to get purer TA than you started with without having to, you know, if you sufficiently powdered it and, and thoroughly mixed it with vinegar, you should be able to get all your ibogaine back. Right. From there to get to the PTA HCL, do you take that um, that product that precipitated and then do you mix it again with vinegar or is that just you mix that straight with acetone? That's that where you mix that with acetone? Yeah, you get to PTA you extract with acetone because and then no. okay, and then that's where you usually add hydrochloric acid to precipitate out. Right. Yeah, you're kinda of using a selection process. In the first step, you're, dissolve, you're, you're, you're taking everything that dissolves in vinegar, which includes everything that dissolves in water. And in the second process, you're taking only those things which dissolve in vinegar and dissolve in acetone. So that's why you're getting half of it left behind. So, so, you know, because not all the, the, the molecules have the same properties. I have a question. Hmm? You start this whole process with two gil kilograms of rhubarb, and you get to the total alkaloid step, how many grams do you have? That's a good question. Who would say Anwar? <sighs> Depends on our yield, what was our <laughs> yield? You don't get three or four percent, am I right? No. Uh, the TA was somewhere yeah, around, we, we were very fortunate. We got a very good yield, which I think was as high as eight, seven or eight. I mean it was really generous. Um, higher than I had uh, anticipated, so that would put it at around 70 grams per kilogram. Now, if you use whole root, of course, you'll have less because root wood, I can say with uh, authority, contains no detectable ibogaine. 
Neither do any of the other plant parts of the iboga. So I know it might seem like stem bark ought to have ibogaine in it. None appeared on TLC. It doesn't taste like ibogaine. Nothing in the leaf, nothing in the fruit. Okay, this is an evaluation of the process I've gone through. Uh, according to those seven criteria uh, for a good process, and I'm very happy with almost all of them. The, you know, the, uh, it's very uh, inexpensive. It doesn't require a lot of training. It's uh, safe. Um, uses common chemicals. They see, the products are stable, and that'll be true of all the methods. Uh, let's see, BT, I think. I think we're talking about uh, the, whether the, there are side effects from the impurities. Basically, what I'm saying here is that the impurities don't seem to pose a big problem here. Nobody seems to say, gee, I took PTA and had this additional uh, side effect that I had never seen with pure ibogaine. Or at least it's a, a, a physiological side effect. Uh, the waste from the process hasn't been a problem. The, the, the big problem I'm worried about is the demand for tabernacle iboga because it seems to be uh, mostly coming from natural source. Now, I did, so I don't forget, I'd like to point out that an alternative to uh, farming the tabernacle iboga, you know, if we wanted to just stick with this method, would be uh, root cell culture. I've seen people start to do research on that, but you know, it, the problem isn't isn't the technology. The problem is really people getting themselves to you know part with enough of their uh, time to do something on a volunteer basis, especially when it's as uh, you know they have to take risk in addition. There's it's it's totally thankless. So. Uh, but it can be done. There's the root cell culture, and I'm trying to think if there's another way to de to uh, get those root cells. But anyway, uh, there are alternatives to just uh, farming iboga. Another possibility, this is the second route, which I'll spend a little less time on. Yes, question? Uh, just a quick question. You mentioned that um, the ibogaine can be detected in the leaf parts and the I stem didn't. parts and such. No taste of ibogaine, no sorry. Wait, I've noticed that the, the latex has a bitter taste to it. At least my plants does. Well, see, I had to have these. I, I guess I didn't. I don't remember uh, actually injuring the plants when we were trying to grow them to, to, to produce. I guess that's. You know, it, it's possible that the uh, latex is bringing alkaloids to and from the roots, and so it might be that you're detecting it that way. that was, um, looked really, really similar to Iboga, and I was just like, wow, okay, it looks like the most similar that I've seen out of all, all of the ones that I've, I've looked at, and uh -huh. its, uh, its latex was very bitter. Uh -huh. It tasted very similar, and yeah. so I wondered about the latex. I sure wish we could go on that, but the best, I've done my best to uh, what research is published about this, this family, and um, there have been a lot of studies on the alkaloids present in plants, but unfortunately, a lot of the studies don't quantify the uh, amount of alkaloids in the plants. Um, so you have to guess, you know, is ibogaine just a trace or is it the main one? Usually they'll say which ones are most predominant. And I don't know of another plant that has ibogaine as the predominant alkaloid. I've got a um, web page I want to show everybody that, that where I put a bibliography that has some of these papers. I wanted to make sure I, I understood the, how, how you end up getting the recovered alkaloid. Um, is, so that's, uh, is that adding ammonia to the remaining liquid that you have after you know, the yellow solid of the PTA, HCL, after that settles? that remaining liquid that's left after you filter out that solid, is that 
Well, kind of. I didn't show it in the pictures. What, what you do is you take the, the acetone filtrate, you boil off the ammonia, oh, sorry, the acetone, you boil off the acetone, okay. you dissolve the, the gum, the oil left over in water, and then you add ammonia to that, treating it as if it were root extract, and it precipitates a solid which you can filter. Okay. So it's a similar process to recovering alkaloid from the root. Um, I'd like to read this patent because this is that key patent by Guterell and Janet that um, it, it was so prophetic. It's about uh, 50 years ahead of its time. Uh, while it would, uh, would appear logical to produce the new products of the invention, in this case noribogaine, which I guess I don't think had a use at that time, from ibogaine, the applicants have found that it is much more advantageous and desirable to prepare these derivatives by starting with vulcangine as a source. It has been found that volcangine is extracted from the bark of the volcanga tree plant. The volcanga africana is able to supply up to 5 grams per kilo. That's half a percent. That just doesn't sound great. Whereas ibogaine is found in the roots of tarbinanth iboga at 3 grams per kilo, 0.3 percent, which sounded really low. You know, I, I'm not sure what's going on there, but I natural variations in, in alkaloid concentration are definitely something to, to, to keep in mind. It is both apparent and obvious that gathering the bark is much easier than gathering the roots. We're talking about Volkanga bark versus Iboga roots. And that the former procedure does not bring about the destruction of the plants. You can actually harvest Volkanga trunk bark without killing the Volkanga tree. So you can sustainably harvest the uh, bark. Of course, if you were to, f if you were to culture um, Iboga root bark cells, I read a paper on that, that you can actually sustainably extract the uh, Ibogaine from that culture too, so that would be another alternative. Um, it should be noted that the Volkanga is more prevalent than the Iboga, which you know, not only is it Volkanga africana, but there's other species too, so that uh, is very hopeful. This is the chemical conversion. If you could get the Vulcan gene, this is the chemical conversion that Guterall and Janet use to convert it to ibogaine. They heat it with potassium hydroxide and methanol for six hours, and then they add a little hydrochloric acid and do uh, purification, which you could probably get down to a recrystallization to make ibogaine. Uh, in other words, you can probably make this as, as uh, this technology could be brought within the same reach as the technology I've gone through so far. And this was his yield, 70 to 85% from Volcangine. And that was after his purification, so he probably threw some ibogaine away just to make it pure. Now this, when I say what's the problem, I'm really saying what's my problem. What is it that I've run into in trying to develop a procedure to, because even when I was with Carl, and this was, this was back 10 years ago or so, uh, I was looking at Volkanga then to see, because I knew about this patent, it hadn't escaped my notice. Um, but I, you know, so the first thing I tried is, well, I, gee, uh, this TLC is a mess. I can't even tell which spot is the, the Volcan gene. I'll just take the whole route and run it through my process. And I was really happy at first because when I, when I tried to make Volkanga TA and Volcanga PTA, not only did it work, but the yields were even higher than they were from Iboga. They, the amount of alkaloid in that bark is apparently higher than they are in, in Iboga bark. So then I took that TA, that Volcanga TA, and just ran it through his, his step here to try to convert it, di to, to make Ibogaine in the mixture without having to isolate it so that at least then I could see how much Ibogaine is there. But I couldn't find any. So I was frustrated. I don't know why that happened. You know, my friend Carl smuggled that fair and square out of Africa, and there were kilo, kilos and kilos of it. And uh, I was really sad to tell him I couldn't tell how to make use of his Volcanga bark, and I still don't know what went wrong. So these, there's complications. I don't know if there's natural variations in the amount of Volcanga or if the mixture for some reason destroys the ibogaine during this chemical process unless the Vulcan gene is made pure first. Now here I'm explaining. What's the problem? The problem is uh, 
Well, one thing, vobtucin and vloacamine, I believe those are called the, the other main, they're, they're alkaloids that are most more, they're, the, they're some of the most predominant alkaloids in this bark. And those show up in a patent uh, where it talks about, I think it talks about vulcangine, vobtucin, and vloacamine. Um, but it's talking about using them as uh, to, as medicines to affect the heart. It's being they're being used as alternatives to digitalis. And the, the the weird thing though is that these two, I believe, are larger. These are like dimeric. They're they're like twice as big as volcanogen. So I don't expect that they would have similar effects um, if they were if they were put through the same process as volcanogen to make it ibogaine. Um, Yep. If, uh, if they're larger, heavier molecules, then couldn't you use like or something to separate them? Because the heavier one would sit to the bottom and the lighter one would rise to the top. Chromatography is, you know, that's, you know, unless you're even worse off than average, it's considered a general chemical procedure. Chromatography, remember the thin layer chromatography I showed you? And that's used for analysis to tell out there in, in the middle of Africa if you've got good root. The nice thing about that is that, you know, it's a little expensive for a box of sheets of that plastic. But once you have them, they're, you know, you'd only need a little bit and it's low tech and it only takes a little solvent, a little containers, and it's, it's very simple for this analysis technique. Now you can scale that up. Instead of using a little bit of silica on a piece of plastic, you could stuff a whole glass tube with the same stuff and use lots of solvent to flush through a mixture like the RA, the recovered alkaloid, to try to separate out the ibogaine. That's what you'd have to do unless you don't know any better. If you, if you, don't, if you don't know anything except that it can be chromatographed, then you have to settle for that technology. The problem is you have to invest in that equipment and those supplies, you make lots of waste. Uh, I mean, it's practical, but it's much less practical for some people than this very low-tech method. You know, I'm not studying those high-tech methods because I realize the people that can use them already know they can use them. They already know how to use those things. You know, the people who are you know, stuck using buckets of ammonia uh, don't have that within reach very easily, and so I'd like to give them a better alternative. Well, centrifuges. Centrifuge to do what? To separate them the way they do uh, uranium from uh, uh, radioactive uranium to spin it and then take the higher the stuff at the top and just put it into the next centrifuge and the next centrifuge and the next If only you knew. That's considered one of the most tedious physical separations there is in the world. We're talking about, what he's talking about is using a mass spectrometer as a production process. You take atoms of uranium that you've vaporized, you give them an electric charge, you pass them through a magnetic field in a high vacuum, and because of their slightly different mass, they fall into slightly different piles over here in some place, one atom at a time. It li that's exactly why we haven't been nuked in San Francisco or New York. It's because that's so hard. <laughs> and it would be similarly hard to do that with a chemical. Um, yeah, I'm hoping that, um, you know, if looked at more carefully, I mean, obviously, well, here we go. This is, this is the most embarrassing slide in the show because this was done last week. Yeah, this, uh, and this is, this is my cell phone, I'm sorry. I can't get a focus in here. But what we're looking at here We've got five samples. These two are the same. This is for reference. This sample was sent 